All right, let me. All right, I think we're on. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tony Darnell, and I am with uh, my friend Alberto Conte for another AAAS Hangout uh, for, from the. Uh, from Long Beach, California, for Long Beach, California, and today I am joined uh, by uh, we have Dr. Mario Olivio, an astrophysicist, with us from the uh, Space Telescope Science Institute, and we are lucky enough to have Emily Lakdawalla with us, also from the she's the senior editor and planetary evangelist for the Planetary Society, and joining us soon, I hope, will be Mike Brown uh, from Caltech. He's also a planetary scientist, and he will. Uh, we will, the topic for today is we're going to talk about the solar system. We're going to talk about planets. We're going to talk about near-Earth objects, Kuiper Belt objects, the latest in some of the uh, planetary missions that are out there. Uh, Emily will talk to us a little bit about the Curiosity and what's going on with New Horizons and all kinds of fun things. Whatever we feel like talking about, we're going to talk about. But the main topic today is going to be the solar system. And... Uh, Mario is going to provide us some uh, lots of different perspectives because he's a big thinker. He's one of the guys that that sort of take what we're learning in astronomy and make it and give us some perspective. And so uh, he'll have some interesting comments for us to say as well. And of course, Alberto's here just to give me a hard time because that's what he always does. <laughs> yes, Hi, Alberto. Of, how are you? <laughs> okay. I'm actually very glad to have Mario here. Mario is uh, one of the big thinkers, and uh, every time too. I talk to Mario, I learn something new. So I'm hoping to learn a lot new today. That's right. And he, you also have a blog, right? I mean, you have that. That is, uh, that we uh, we we get the posts, or at least I get the posts uh, via the email when he gets oh, them. Here's Mike. Oh, and here's Mike Brown. Welcome, Mike. Can you hear us? <laughs> can I hear you? But maybe you can hear us. I think uh, we can see you, but we can't hear you. Can you hear us okay, Mike? Uh, he's looking around like he's not hearing us. Okay. So hopefully he will be able to... Oh, it hurt. Oh, he's writing something. Okay. Write something that says, I cannot hear you. put a sign up. Here we go. Time. I can't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear. <laughs> well, that's odd. Do you, uh, you you do have us? Oh, do you, it, maybe the little gear icon in the upper. Uh, maybe the gear icon in the uh, upper right in the, of the hangout Hello. window is. Uh, ah, I just heard him. Yeah. All right. So we are dealing with some technical issues. We can. We can definitely hear you. Okay. So while Mike gets his, uh, hopefully he'll, he'll get some of the uh, uh, technical issues worked out a little bit. But uh, let's get started by talking about um, some of the latest missions that are out there with uh, with with the solar system. Emily, what do I, I follow you on on uh, Twitter a lot. I see you on Google Plus a lot. What are some of the things that you're heavily involved in and you're following right now? Well, it's a terrific time in planetary exploration right now. There's a ton of active missions out there. There are active missions at Mercury and, and Venus and the Moon and Mars and Saturn and uh, just left an asteroid or on our way to the first Kuiper Belt object to be explored by a spacecraft. So it's it's really a very exciting time. Yeah, and um, I, I also I always forget to do this at the beginning of a hangout. But let me let me also mention to any, everybody watching that you we are anxious to hear your comments. I'm tracking your comments in three different ways. Uh, on the on the YouTube channel that you may be watching, I'm following most of your comments there. You can also make uh, leave uh, uh, a, a comment via Twitter using the hashtag SpaceFan. And I'll see them as, there as well. And there's also the uh, Google Plus event page for this event. If you're watching it on that, I am also following those comments as well. So uh, those are so please, as we're talking, please leave your comments. I'm going to interrupt the conversation with uh, with uh, uh, and, and and ask as many of them as I can get access to. There's Mike again. Are you there? Can you hear us? All the way up there. Just have an email, buddy. Oh, okay. All right. So, uh, one of the reasons we're 
one of the reasons we're here is there's a lot of people walking around the booth right now and they don't I don't think they appreciate what we're trying to do. <laughs> That's all right. That's a lot of distractions. So thanks for your patience, guys. Uh, so um, Emily was, uh, uh, I guess one of the things I wanted to know is um, the, the the Curiosity probes. They're they're up. They're doing uh, the Curiosity probe. There's there's just one. Uh, the the rover. Uh, how's it doing? Uh, it's doing great, but the scientists haven't really been given the keys yet. They're still working on uh, working through all of what they call their first time activities. They've um, dusted off all the scientific instruments, all the science instruments seem to be working great. The very last thing that they have to do for the first time is to drill into a rock. And so they've actually spent the last couple of weeks driving around to find the right kind of rock to drill into for the first time. It's got to be flat lying so that they can load their drill down onto and press very hard and, and stabilize it um, in order to drill into it. It also has to be homogeneous, meaning that there can't be lots of different kinds of grains of different kinds of materials of different sizes. Um, and that's actually proving to be a little bit difficult at this site because it turns out that they're looking at rocks that are built up of lots of pebbles and grains of materials that washed down from the hills, you know, billions of years ago. And the rocks that we're seeing are really quite inhomogeneous. They've got all different kinds of mineral grains in them. I've even seen one mineral grain that looked like a piece of quartz, which is quite common on Earth, but not at all common on Mars. So um, they've they've taken a while to do it, but they think they're going to get done with their first drilling activity by the uh, middle of February and then finally we'll be able to get on the road toward that mountain in the middle of the crater which is what they came here to study in the first place. Now I, this is this is uh, correct me if I'm wrong I'm not, I'm not familiar with all of the details of what of what it has but isn't it true that Curiosity has the first chemistry lab on it since the Viking probes I believe is that correct? Um, I would say that, that uh, Phoenix also had a pretty neat chemistry lab that it brought to the North Pole of Mars, but there's no question that Curiosity is the most sophisticated set of science instruments um, sent to, surface, to the surface of Mars since Viking, and some would probably argue it's, it's even more sophisticated. It has two big instruments on it called um, the sample analysis at Mars, which is a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, a uh, quadrupole mass spectrometer, and a tunable laser spectrometer, all packed oh, into one microwave-sized thing. Now, I'm scared. <laughs> She's been practicing that. She's been practicing saying that. And the other one is Chemin, which is in turbocharged. <laughs> <laughs> and fuel injected. Awesome. The other one's Chemin, which is an X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescence uh, analyzer. And I got a chance to use one of those once when I was actually an undergrad. And, you know, it's, it's a room-sized kind of thing. And it's, it's really astonishing that they managed to miniaturize it enough to get it onto this rover and land it on the surface of another planet. Wow, that's amazing. So um, now, what do you what do you think the um, so one of the one of the I think science requirements or maybe the science goals for Curiosity is going to be to try and attempt to find some kind of signatures of life, right? Something that some organic compounds past life, past life, past life, right? That may have contributed to life on Mars. Is that correct? Yeah, what they're what they're looking for is environments that could have supported life in the past. Um, they're being careful. You know, Viking was sent to Mars with a package that was designed to detect life. And the results were equivocal at, at best. Um, and they kind of, a, a friend of mine who's a Mars scientist said that Viking, with Viking they swung for the fences and they struck out. So they've been taking a much more measured approach to finding out whether Mars could have supported life in the past. What Curiosity is going to be doing is, is what any good geologist would do when confronted with a new stack of rocks. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. You look at how the different minerals um, are in different layers of the rocks and that tells you about the paleo environment that existed at that time. And we want to know, was Mars wet for a long time or was it mostly dry? Um, how frequently did the climate change and was the kind of climate that we had on Mars able to support, um, would it have been able to support Earth-like life? Um, and we also would like to see if we can detect carbon-bearing compounds inside those rocks. We have detected a uh, very small carbon-bearing compound, but it's too early in the mission to actually know whether the carbon came from Earth with the rover or whether it was there on Mars in the first place. It's not a, a problem with the mission, it's just it's a complicated kind of measurement to be making, and so you have to wait until you've done enough of these things in order to be really sure that what you're looking at actually came from Mars. So there's a lot more to come from this mission. And, um, it's going to be pretty exciting. Now that's a that's an interesting idea. That maybe um, uh, what do you have a sense of of whether 
they're going to find anything? I mean, what's your what's your do you have a do you have a like an opinion? I know that there's no there's no data to back this up, but do you have any opinion on what it, what it might find? Well, they certainly have gone to a place where there are really good signals from orbit that there are very interesting uh, minerals, different kinds of rocks present and very close to the surface. And when they landed here, you know, looking at all of the pictures that you can see of Curiosity's landscape, it's a geologist paradise. There is bedrock exposed everywhere. The, um, opportunity and spirit have often had to work to find bedrock that they can analyze, but this, it's, I mean, it, it would be really hard to choose targets. There's so many different kinds of rock exposed so neatly, just waiting for curiosity to explore. So as a geologist, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, that sounds, so I'm going to tell you what I think about this whole thing, and now I'm going to bring Mario in on this too. Mario, have you ever heard of something called the Great Filter? It's this thing where, you know, if there are various stages in the, in the, uh, possible progression of life through a civilization that could have prevented it from happening. And here's, and here's why I don't, I kind of hope we don't find life on Mars because, or any evidence that, it, or any evidence that maybe smaller, simpler life forms could have existed. Because if we find life on Mars, it, I mean any form or any signs of it at all in the past, that means to me that life is pretty simple, right? To go that, that to go from something that has no life to something that has life is actually a pretty simple process. Not and necessarily. That... <laughs> so there is one there is one way that that uh, that there's one argument that I can make against that. And the argument okay. is that there's um, people have done experiments to show that you could take a rock that had some kind of spores, you know, some kind of microorganisms on it, blast it off the surface of Mars with a large um, asteroid impact that rock would experience a great deal of acceleration but wouldn't necessarily be heated to a very high temperature the thing could float around in space for a long time and land on earth and so you could have you there is the possibility that life originated just once on mars and was carried to earth very early in the solar system's history yeah, yeah, yeah. so so let me make a few comments on that okay uh, so first of all uh, there is a much higher probability for a rock flying from mars to earth than from the Earth flying to Mars. But the probability of something flying from the Earth to Mars is non-zero. So in principle, if you find something here or there, you could have make the argument that maybe life started in one of them and then moved to the other place. You know, more easily from Mars to Earth than otherwise. But yes. However, I'll make the comment that the evidence of life on Earth already, irrespective of Mars, seems to have shown that the start of life on Earth was really fairly easy in the sense that you see the first signs of life, you know, more of life more than uh, three and a half billion years ago, right. which means that just as the Earth cooled, almost immediately life of some form appeared. Yes, but that's... That, so that, maybe the start of life, maybe not that difficult. Well, it depends. It, that could have been the result of a very fortuitous panspermia kind of event, which is what you guys are talking about. You're talking about rocks going from one planet to another, seeding life. What could have happened is a comet could have could come have by been. relatively could early have been. Could have been. in Earth's history and started life. Could have been, that but it say. also could have been the result of simple chemistry on Earth. That's what I, and my argument is, if it is just, when you go the step from just chemistry to life, that step could be a great filter. That could be hard. Nobody knows how hard that is. Okay, so. Hence, Fermi notwithstanding. So there is this, so there is this person, Jack Shostak at Harvard, who does these experiments of origin of life. And Jack Shostak has already created membranes of cells just from chemistry and according to him they are basically five years away from creating life in the lab from, from chemistry chemicals. okay well in that case then they, then, then it isn't it, then, then I rest then I won't argue the point anymore but I'm still not convinced that it's easy and and uh, I, I agree that if we do find evidence of life on Mars that it could have come from Earth or from a rock from somewhere else but that still means that that happened somewhere else and it doesn't mean that we can't have 
that that's not a very difficult thing. I would just like to see live so we can settle the argument. I mean, exactly. Find out yeah, you're getting sick of hearing system, me so talk yeah, about so this. Yeah, so we can settle the argument because <laughs> I, I actually personally believe it's, uh, I, 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 I told this to you yep. last time, yep. I, I think life is, uh, is ubiquitous. It's going to be like a weed. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not convinced. Grow, it will probably grow. But hey, so, yeah, um, can, uh, hey, Mike, we've got Mike. you. Awesome. Yeah, I can hear it. Yay! Uh, and I just wanted to throw in my two cents on this one. Uh, uh, by all means. Which is that, you know, uh, I, I, I totally agree with what Emily said. I... I I actually am of the opinion that it, there is it is impossible for there not to be life on Mars just because contamination. I mean, you know, I I, I have tried to decontaminate my my kitchen sink many times and and I can't do it. So if if, <laughs> if life from Earth ever landed on Mars, which it had to have at some point, then there's life on Mars and it's still there somewhere and we'll eventually find it. So it's I I mean I I think that will be really cool when we find it if we find it. But the interesting things to think about is is are there other very different places where there are life in the solar system. Does Europa have life underneath its icy shell? Uh, does Titan right. have some sort of Titan have life. bizarro Titan, life? Yes. Does Enceladus? And you know, and this is one of the reasons that we're interested in those places, and one of the reasons that we're uh, exploring planets around other stars. Because okay, there you don't have to worry about the contamination. You, as much as you could do these experiments in the laboratory and think you know the answer, I'm not going to believe anything until we see some other evidence that life really formed independently. I, I, I'm still not convinced the answer isn't that it is just incredibly difficult and you need those, those that, that one out of a however many chance to make it happen. At the same time, maybe it's just simple, but we'll find out the answers to these. Not on Mars, I don't think, because I think we're too contaminated, but in all these other places. That's an interesting point. Okay, so yes, so I I'll concede that if we find life on Mars, that that it, it's it's probable and even 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 likely at some point because of the contamination issue. And we're also kind of talking about two different things. One is the, the panspermia going from one planet to another, and the actual start of it independently at some point. And uh, that's a question that I think would be a really. But then, but then I think you know to add something else. I think uh, today Mike gave a very very interesting talk about the. The, the formation history of our of our own solar system, and I think, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. I hope you guys can hear him okay. Yeah, and and I think one of the other possibilities is that uh, you start seriously thinking about uh, about taking a look at the only example of life that we have on our on our in you know, our solar system and figure out how likely it is that it can form in in other areas. How likely it is that, that we were contaminated by maybe Kuiper belt objects that have, as Emily mentioned, you know, it's a presence of life. You know, mm -hmm. and so I think. The talk that he gave today was pretty inspiring because, uh, and humbling, I have to say, because he basically said we know very little about uh, how, how, you know, what the characteristics are even of, on, of our own solar system. And I th so I think it's a, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I cannot hear myself anymore. I, I hear you. I hear you. Okay. So I don't know now. <laughs> but so I, I, thought, I thought it was very interesting. Maybe Mike can actually talk about this because I also uh, was going to ask Mario a few questions about this. But I think it's important to understand that. Uh, I guess the only example that we have of, of sort of life and even formation of life is, is our own solar system. So speculation is wild at this point. Am I right, Mike? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I Go ahead. well, I, I agree that it is, is uh, the speculation is wild as only you have this one uh, example. But I also want to remind you that uh, the fact that the, this is the only place where you have life has remained as humanity's last bastion of being unique because right. you know until yes. now okay so we now know we're not we're not in the center of the solar system the solar system is far away in the galaxy there are hundreds of billions of galaxies like ours the stuff we're made of is just four percent of what there is in the universe and all that so this Copernican non-significance of yeah. humans have only has only become larger and larger and the fact that this is the only place where we have life has remained this one hour Fast only enough, claim yeah. for uniqueness yes. Yes. so <laughs> I, I I think this is gonna fall I don't think most people want that to, to be a claim of uniqueness you know so all these other things in the past everybody wanted us to be special in some way I, I think in general people would be much happier if we weren't special if it really were true that the the galaxy uh, was teeming with life so it's sort of the, the opposite of all these other ways that we thought we were special to begin with I, I actually think there's one way that we are I we are we are certainly odd if not uh, unique is that you know as much as at this this meeting uh, all week long 
if nothing else from this meeting, you learn that the planets are sort of everywhere and every every place you can possibly imagine and every niche is occupied. It is still true that something like the solar system has still really not been found. As much as there's this emphasis on uh, habitable planets, um, habitable planets doesn't mean the same thing as as like the solar system. The solar system is a pretty weird place. It has it has a re one really large planet, Jupiter, at you know in a very regular orbit in a very regular place, and a lot of other things in regular orbits. Um, we haven't found anything like that. Doesn't mean they're not out there. Well, we could still be uh, the weird exception in that way, which could still be some in some way that we don't understand the weird exception why uh, why life might be easier here, might not be easier here. I have no idea. I don't I don't have any preconceptions about uh, if it's if it's easy or hard. Um, I just want to know the answer. Yeah. Mike, I, I I agree with you that you know we have not yet found a precise solar system analog, uh, but at the same time. We don't know that you need a precise solar no. system analog to have life. You know, there is, they announced a system at this meeting where they have a planet that has a radius of 1.6 Earth radii orbiting a G8 star, which has 5,000 instead of 6,000 degrees on the surface, and it's orbiting in the habitable zone. So who said that you couldn't have right. life there? So the, the the interesting point. So I'm I'm a little bit uh, um, strange in this way because I, in the end, I actually don't care that much about life. I consider life this trace contaminant on the surface of interesting things. The interesting things being planets <laughs> and um, and planetary systems. And so I, I the 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 single-minded uh, emphasis on can we find something in the habitable zone. I actually have to admit that I get a little bit tired of it. Um, I'm actually really interested. I would love to know, are there things, I'm not talking about precise analogs of the solar system, I just mean like, can you find Jupiter-sized objects at 5 AU in circular orbits? If if I could give you one thing that I would say the solar system is, it is Jupiter at 5 AU in a circular orbit. And so, so, I would there are, so there are about 4% of the extrasolar planets found where you have uh, something that is a, of a giant planet out just outside the snow line for those types of uh, systems. So that to me is Close to, fairly yeah. similar to the solar system. So I want that circular orbit though. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it actually, it, it, our, it, our, this is what I think I wonder is, is our solar system, our solar system is so incredibly regular. You know, 20 years ago when I first started teaching planetary formation, it was regular and we knew why. We could tell you exactly how planets form and why, and they have to be in these regular systems like this. So now, of course, we know that there's almost nothing that's in a regular, uh, big regular system like this that we found. And so now I'm, I, I just am kind of dying to know, will there be real solar system, regular, circular, planar, uh, those sides, which is... Uh, Mike, yep. correct me if I'm wrong. So to get... To when you gave a talk today, you show, for example, that there are some uh, instances where resonances actually in the inner planets eject some planets from the solar system, but then they, they sort of circularize the orbits of the other planets. So, so I'm assuming that that's just a simulation. So, I mean, why is it so hard for you to, uh, to, to think that you can find actually planets that have circular orbits? No, no, I don't think it's hard to find. I mean, and if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have absolutely insisted that's the way every planetary system under the sun is. Um, uh -huh. It's just that we haven't found them. That's Wait, the but, but there are planets that are in fairly circular orbits. Yeah, okay. I mean, very low e eccentricity. They, they are, there's some, we are, we are weird in some ways. And so far, I, I still look around at all the planetary systems found, and I don't see anything that reminds me of the important characteristics of the solar system. And I have to say, having an Earth in the habitable zone is, is sort of a trivial part of our solar system. Having Jupiter so in a like circular orbit. So it sounds like you're really bothered by the fact that we haven't that we expected to see regular planets in orbit around their stars, and we haven't. And now we're seeing, in fact, we're seeing almost anything but. And that's really that's really bothering you. But I guess, what does that tell you? Maybe it's not such. I, it doesn't bother me at all. I think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, 
you know, again, 20 years ago, we thought we absolutely knew that this is exactly what we're finding, and the fact that we didn't find that is, I mean, you can't get better than that. You know, if we just yeah, found what we thought. You know, an, an eccentricity of zero is, you know, is a set of almost zero measure. <laughs> I mean, so clearly you have a distribution of eccentricities, yes. and, uh, right. you know... So uh, let's let's let, so we've what I, I want to get to a couple of the comments that we're getting on YouTube because uh, there's a lot of them coming through right now and um, so uh, from YouTube I have one from uh, Samir Hariri who asks why do we keep searching for Earth and Earth size and like exoplanets can there not be life on planets bigger and smaller than Earth and I'll let any of the planetary guys take that one. I have to say, if we think that there could be life on Europa and Titan in our own solar system, then we ought to broaden the definition of what a habitable zone is around some of these other stars. That's, a, that's an excellent that's point. A very, very good point. Yeah, right? you've got to re right. redefine what habitable habitable might be. Um, right. So, how involved are uh, both uh, Emily and, and Mike? Are you guys involved much in the uh, New Horizons uh, mission going out to Pluto? I, I I'm not at all. It's um. And I'm I'm excited. I'm interested in seeing what the pictures come back. Uh, but uh, you know, you have to figure out where to spend your time in life. And and I I have not often decided to spend my time on spacecraft because they just take so long. I love telescopes. You go fly out to the telescope. You go use it. You get your data right then. You don't have to wait 15 years to get there. And I'm I'm kind of impatient that way. Yeah, New Horizons certainly is taking its time to get there, even though it's one of the fastest things we've ever launched. I'm not, I'm not on the mission, but I've certainly been watching it from uh, the very start. And it's, it's unique, I think, among missions um, for one reason, which is that when they look forward to planning their, their planetary encounters, and they wanted to think about what kinds of pretty pictures they could take with their cameras while they were flying by these very picturesque things like Jupiter and presumably Pluto and Charon. They actually threw that out to the public. They said, here's our trajectory. Um, you simulate, the, you know, use whatever simulators you want, figure out when would be good moments for us to snap our camera, give us the suggestions, and we'll see if we can work a couple of them in. And it turned out that they managed to get three of the public suggested images into their Jupiter flyby, a couple of really gorgeous pictures of Jupiter with moons, um, one of two moons together, Io and Europa with Io erupting. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool that they've involved the public like that, and they, they have already done that as well with the pluto Charon encounter. And I'm sure they're going to be throwing their images right out there to the public for everybody to see um, as soon as they start getting them, which will be January um, two years from now? 2015, two yeah, two years. Yeah. Oh, good. That's, that was going to be my next question. Do we have an mm -hmm. update on when we might uh, expect to see something from that? Okay, great. Yeah, I still hope to live till then. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to move to, uh, um, let's see, um, let's, let me, I'm just looking through some of the other, uh, actually, as a side comment, I thought that Mike was not in the New Horizons team because he killed Pluto, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, it is it is not clear I would be welcome, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yes. So I have it so on my on my YouTube channel I've been for since two thousand six been posting astronomy videos and I've been getting a lot of different comments uh, and questions that I don't I don't always have the expertise to answer because I tend to be more of a cosmology guy and more of a galaxy and, and sort of a deep field sort of person. And to have both of you on here to hang out is great because now one of the single biggest concerns and topics that I get questions about uh, concerns the asteroid Apophis. Uh, and I want to ask you guys, for those who aren't familiar with it, there was a, there's going to be a flyby in I think 2029 of Apophis and then depending on how it goes, it may or may not uh, come back around in 2036 and have an even closer flyby or even hit us. Can you guys give us some perspective on this thing? Is there anything to worry about from Apophis? Mike, do you want to take that one? <laughs> you, you go ahead. Okay, I can go ahead. Sure. So, so Apophis is one of, of a few asteroids that have trajectories where we just don't know enough about the future trajectory to know whether they're going to hit us or not. Um, and there's a, a few objects that have these paths that if they happen to pass through a certain region of space very close to Earth on their next close flyby, it could deflect its trajectory into one that would impact Earth, which would, of course, be a very bad thing. 
So the main thing that we need to do to retire the risk from these asteroids is actually to study them better and to get better data on what their trajectories are because in all likelihood they're not on trajectories that are going to impact us and if we just know with more precision what those orbits are then we will it most likely find out that it's actually not a hazard at all. Um, if we can't do that with telescopes, you can do it with a tagging mission, one where you send a space that could be a very small spacecraft with nothing but a, a radio transmitter. If you throw that radio transmitter onto the asteroid, then we will have um, amazingly good orbital data on it. And again, we will probably find out that it is not actually a hazard. So, um, so I, w I just want to add, I'm a theorist, so I never know the names of these objects. But there is an asteroid that was supposed to come very close or hit us in 2026, that's and maybe the that's, the that's the one. That's I'm thinking of, yeah. Okay. I can remember if it was 26 or 29. And, right, and since then, uh, that orbit actually has been recalculated, and it's actually going to miss us by millions of miles. The first time around. Yes. Right, that yes. I know, but what and, about... And then there is, well, and then there is a, it's supposed to come back and so on in 2044, I think. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and that orbit, I think, has not yet been uh, very precisely calculated. So, uh, so, yes, but, you know, every time you push this for another 20 years, then you have a chance to recalculate and, you know, do better things like, like Emily said, you know, okay. and so on. So, so, so this, this reminds me of another question I wanted to ask Mike. So, Mike, with the Kuiper Belt objects and things that are flying by at these high eccentricities from your talk today, I gathered we have a sense of some of these objects. We obviously don't know where all of them are. Are you interested in using any of the large base, uh, ground-based sky surveys that are supposed to have a relatively high time cadence for finding these objects? Oh, yeah. This, this is going to be um, uh, really what remakes this entire field. Um, so the, the one that I'm most excited about is the, the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is um, um, going into Chile in 2019, 2020, mm -hmm. and it's going to uh, cover the whole sky, essentially cover the whole sky every five days, um, looking for everything, but including a, a very good survey for things that move. You know, I, I spent about a decade surveying the whole northern hemisphere for these bright Kuiper Belt objects, um, leading to all these new discoveries, and, and, and they basically redo what I did um, much, much better every five days. And uh, that's, again, I said this in an earlier talk today, it's kind of depressing when you think about that, um, but it's also just incredibly exciting. There are going to be thousands and thousands of new objects in the Kuiper Belt, near-Earth asteroids, main belt asteroids. Um, it's going to be an incredible uh, survey for really understanding, for, for drilling through the solar system, finding where all those those minor bodies are, and um, even though the minor bodies don't carry much of the mass of the solar system, they carry a lot of the information of the solar system. So studying those, finding more of them, learning more about them is going to be just an incredibly exciting thing. Do you have a sense of how much we know? I mean, how uh, do we have a good handle on just how many of these Kuiper Belt objects there are versus what what's yet to be discovered? So we, we now know of about... Uh, 1,500 objects in the Kuiper Belt, which I'm, I'm amazed at that number just from, you know, the first one was discovered about 15 years ago and uh, oh, almost 20 years ago now. Um, and uh, they just started ramping up like crazy. Um, but now, you know, discovering Kuiper Belt objects is pretty easy. When, when I, if I want to go do a project where I, ha I need a new batch of Kuiper Belt objects, I can go off to a big telescope with a big camera. The Subaru telescope is my favorite one these days. And in two nights, I can find two or 300 new Kuiper Belt objects to study for some phenomenon that I'm looking for. Uh, the same thing is now going to happen with LSST. And there will be um, tens of thousands, uh, maybe up to 40,000, 50,000 um, well-studied, well-characterized Kuiper Belt objects uh, that will, you know, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's these, these objects in the Kuiper Belt. They, they occupy funny little places in, in dynamical places in the way their orbits are. And each of those funny little places that you find them sort of tells you about something that happened in the solar system. And right now we know the big places where a lot of them hang out. And we see that some of them are locked to Neptune, some of them are interacting with planets. Um, but by finding so many of them, we'll be able to really look and find detail at, at all the places they are and start to roll back the history of how they got there and how the outer solar system put itself together.
Of course, these giant surveys are also going to be turning up a lot of much nearer by potentially hazardous asteroids. And it creates a, a interesting kind of communication problem for the experts because um, like, like I said earlier, we know that most of these are going to turn out not to be impactors. But how do you communicate that? How do you communicate the relative safety but also the urgency that at some point we are going to find one that is on a trajectory that will impact us? Um, how do you balance those things and how do you communicate that to the public? It's, it's going to be an interesting challenge once the LSST comes online. There is a comment I want to make about asteroids. It's, okay. it's not a direct answer to what you asked. But we are so used to thinking about asteroids as these uh, big dangers for life, you know, because one of them could make life extinct. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to make the point that it is very possible that asteroids are also the ones that gave life to Earth because uh, asteroids may have brought the water, you know, the, the surface water that we have. They may have brought the heavy metals that may have brought life itself and an impact by a big object probably created the large moon that we have. Yeah, but, so, the, but the problem with one of them visiting us now is, is pretty... <laughs> co correct, well, correct. They did correct. their job, but, now they should go But remember, you know, yeah, I, wrote, right. <laughs> I wrote a blog piece that was called, uh, you know, Asteroids Giveth and Asteroids Taketh Away. <laughs> so, you know, so uh, it, it may be... <laughs> but, so, you know, even, even a very, very... Even a very big impact right now, it would be a bad day for us, but it it would be extremely hard for an asteroid to extinguish all life on Earth. Life is incredibly tenacious. It clings. Uh, right. It's gone down extremely deep in Earth's crust. I think that it would take like a moon forming type of impact in order to extinguish yes. all life on Earth. Well, in fact, there is a study that showed that during the late, at the end of the late heavy bombardment, with all of the huge impacts happening at that time, during none of the late heavy bombardment was Earth's surface sterilized. So life could have originated before the late heavy bombardment and survived right on through it just with just fine. Not, not only that, sometimes I like to speculate that where it's not for that asteroid that probably killed the dinosaurs, maybe we would not have been here. Well, <laughs> yes, and so while life may be tenacious, mammals, not so much. And obviously, neither were a lot of the dinosaurs. Either. I want to ask you a question, actually, to Mike, because he brought up a good point, which is uh, I'm a big, big fan of LSST for very different reasons, for very large surveys and yep. galaxies. Yep. So, but, but I think the fact you're going to have, you're going to find transits, you're going to find, you're going to monitor the sky every three or four days or so, is extremely important for, for, uh, for understanding, I think, the formation of a solar system. So, so instead of having, you know, hundreds of. Uh, Hyperbell object, when you have 50 or 100,000, how is that going to change the way you do research? I mean, what kind of constraints are you going to put on the formation of the solar system? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question in, in two ways. So the first question was, how does it change the way you do research? And, and uh, that's almost a terrifying question. There's going to be so much data coming down um, from LSST. You know, it's, it's still a decade out, um, but we're actually uh, making serious preparations now for how we're going to deal with that with that data. Yeah, we, we talked to them yesterday and they said 16 terabytes a night. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's more than I can probably, you know, keep on my phone at one point. So that's going to be even then that'll be a hard thing to do. And and so the data comes down goes to the big supercomputer centers and no human is going to look at most of the data. So most of the data is going to be processed and you're going to end up with with data products of what you're looking for and you have to think rethink about how you do astronomy. Right now I do astronomy by thinking where am I going to point the telescope and I'm going to then look at the data that comes down. Now you're, the data is all going to be out there and it's going to be out there for everybody. It's all public immediately. Um, you'll be able to just grab, you have to think in a different way about how you want to access and, and analyze those data. So so what I'm, I'm most excited about in the, in the Kuiper Belt, for every one of these Kuiper Belt objects that's discovered in LSST, it will get the, the, the two quickest pieces of information give you a lot of information. It's one one moderately quick is it gets its orbit, so you it sort of gives you a little, a little bit of the history of how it got to where it is, because you see where it is, it's not where it started. You can kind of try to figure out how it got to where it is. And the one other little clue is you'll get a color from LSST, and color is a really, really crude way for us of trying to figure out what it's made out of. You know, you can imagine looking at different rocks, they have different colors. You wish you knew more, 
LSST is only going to give us that. Uh, that's actually one of the things I talked about earlier today about uh, JWST is going to help us actually really figure out what these things are made out of. But but knowing 50,000, how they got to where they are and what they're made out of and, and where maybe they started in the solar system, we're really going to be able to start to put together, I think, pretty detailed stories of how the planets moved around and pushed around everything in the in the early history. I think Mario had actually an interesting yeah. paper recently about the snow line and actually how planetesimals. Uh, yeah, yeah, do work. You, you're right. Yeah, it, that, that's uh, that was uh, you know I, I did a conjecture uh, right. that where the snow line should be and where the asteroid belt should be it was concerned to that. Yes. No, but I wanted just to mention jokingly that uh, Mozart wrote a piece of music where you could actually, the way you play it, you would throw dice to decide how to play the order of the things. And you can calculate that actually in a human lifetime, you cannot play all the different variations that arise. Wow. So in the same way, you know, you know, there will be data that no human That's would right. ever, ever see. That's very encouraging, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mike, I just wanted to uh, comment based on what my uh, we had the LSST guys here yesterday, and I talked to them. I'm going to we had some technical difficulties, so I'm going to be posting this on YouTube later. But uh, uh, we talked to Jeffrey Cantor and the project scientists also, uh, and what you're going to what what they're planning on doing is sending out just thousands of alerts almost yeah. every day. So what'll probably happen to you <laughs> is you'll start getting inundated with right. all of it. You'll subscribe to some kind of alert system, right? Right. So as, as LSST takes more data, they get these possible targets, and then you'll right. uh, you'll be so, alerted to what those so, are. So you know, a, a too many alerts is is uh, is too much of a good thing. So your your job as an astronomer then will be to to, to think of filter. You're you're a data scientist. Filter out. You're you are no longer someone who works with photons and optics. You're That's someone right. who works with data and filtering data and figuring out how do you get rid of Actually, all these junk. And get see the things that you want to see. It's it's a, uh, it's going to be interesting. I you know because this is going to be such a big change into how astronomy works. I, I'm I'm serious when I say we we have started here in the last year trying to ramp up understanding how to do that more data driven uh, Kuiper Belt astronomy to be to be ready because, you know if you're not ready when the flood comes you're just going to be uh, be washed away I think. Actually, I think that that's sort of my field of interest and expertise, if you will. So I think data mining is going to become uh, yet more important for a couple of reasons. One is you're going to be bombarded, obviously, by this. So you're going to have to try to distinguish, let's say, the high signal to noise one, the one that are really, really out there. So the outliers, the one that's extremely important. But then at the same time, you're going to have this uh, sort of uh, uh, continuously running algorithms that actually mine your large data sets to actually find those uh, that are interesting, but perhaps uh, maybe in the noise, and give you constraints on the formation, in this case, of the solar system, or... Mm. ...on the strange objects that are, in the, that are in the universe. So I think it's a very, very challenging time, but I think we need to get uh, uh, to get where we can actually uh, do this systematically, and it, we're not there yet. we up this with a question, a good question from... Uh and uh, I want to make uh, this is to both Emily and Mike. Um, it, it, this is from Russell Bateman on the YouTube channel. And question for the planetary scientists: What destination would you choose on a search for life in our solar? Anyone? Anyone want to take that? I thought it was a good. I think I. Heard, uh, what mission? I, I I nominate Emily. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking? Everybody looks oh, frozen. Oh, Mike. Well, we can no. only hear about how. Did you not hear it? Yeah. No, we hear you. Um, okay. We hear you fine. You're having you're having latency issues. I heard you issues. intermittently. Yeah, the network is going up and down. Oh. We got it. So yeah, but we got your question. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe this, we're probably at break time here at the. At the... Oh yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Have you thought about what uh, what what? Would be, I, let's say this another way. What would be an ideal mission? For both of you, are there any in the in the works or things that you're looking forward to? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's so many different reasons like to that? send missions to different parts of the solar system, and so if you're if you're really interested in sampling 
um, a, a kind of watery environment that is the sort of the soup that you might think about cooking up life in, one of the perfect places to go for that is to fly past Enceladus, which is this very small moon of Saturn that has these extremely active geysers spewing out of the South Pole. And the currently most accepted, although still controversial, theory is and that it relates to us, but we lost it relates to an ocean that is actually um, basically in contact with space. Okay, so okay. Sorry, we're 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 playing around with we're having some uh, issues with the with the internet here. So uh, we may be uh, we're still here. Emily's we may be uh, losing each other's. Yeah, yeah, and I heard it too. So I, I it was just these two are dropping out. So. Um, uh, I, there was a question for uh, Mike Brown, and I'm trying to find the guy's name, but I can't seem to find it by now. But it, uh, he wanted to know: um, Do you have a sense of how much mass there is uh, uh, out in the Kuiper Belt? And maybe we, as a percentage, I don't know how, what the best way to answer that would be. Yeah, so, so there's a percentage we, or, or in kilograms. Um, we usually say it in terms okay. of, um, of of Earth masses or actually lunar masses, because that's really what we're talking about. We think that the Kuiper Belt started out. Um, moderately massive, something like 35 Earth masses. And you could, you could imagine if the, all those 35 Earth masses got together into one clump, you would have had a real planet going on out there, but they never had the chance to do it. Um, and instead, that initial 35 Earth masses um, got, got tossed around. This is one of the things we're trying to find out. Tossed around, tossed out, ground down into dust, and we're down to a very small fraction of that, something like... Uh, a, a thousand times less than initially started out there. So it's so it's only a very small fraction of an Earth mass, um, even a small fraction of a of a lunar mass, out there. Now we think um, uh, we have just a little bit of evidence, but we think it's true that beyond the Kuiper Belt, there's another large belt of material which has potentially much more mass than that. But it's so far away um, that we don't we just don't know very much about it. We haven't had enough. Uh, discoveries out there to really start to define its characteristics, but but overall it's still it's still a very small amount of mass. At the same time, it's a lot more mass than the asteroid belt. Um, the largest, uh, the most massive Kuiper belt object, Eris, is is more massive than Pluto by the total mass of the asteroid belt. So the total mass of the asteroid belt is just a tiny fraction of the mass of these largest Kuiper belt objects. I hadn't heard that comparison before. That's pretty cool. Isn't that great? I love that one. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it blew my mind. You knew, uh, Mike, I interviewed you for this article that hasn't actually been printed yet in Sky and Telescope. It'll come out at some point about the, the Kuiper belt and all the things we've been finding there. And when I started researching that article, I had no idea how many large round objects there are out there. There's roughly 200, which is about four times as many round things as there are interior to the Kuiper Belt. Yeah. So, I mean, they're not as big as the as the planets, but there's there's a lot of round worlds, worlds that that geophysicists at least would think were large enough and interesting enough to study individually as different worlds. So it's it's pretty exciting all the stuff that we're finding out there. Yeah, there is a comment I want to make about the mass in the asteroid belt. So. Uh, the mass in the asteroid belt, is, as Mike pointed out, is rather small. But uh, yes. let's suppose that Jupiter would have actually migrated in the, in the initial disk through where the asteroid belt is. The, then this asteroid belt would have been almost completely dissipated. Things would have been thrown out of that. So if you think that asteroids were important for life, then you don't want such a situation where, you know, the large planet migrated through that. On the other hand, if Jupiter had not migrated at all, then the asteroid belt is thought to have formed with much more mass in originally, you know, maybe as much as an Earth mass. And that would have resulted in so many impacts that it would have perhaps not allowed life to develop. So we may have been lucky in that Jupiter migrated a little bit. It depleted Enough. the asteroid belt, but still left it there. But I guess my, the, the answer is going to be, I, I guess when we find some other example, we can probably tell, right? Right now, the that's only right. example we have. That's right. That's so right. To see how well, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, really this, this, is a, this is a part of what I've been, been sort of talking about all day today, which is that 
yes, it's true that we won't, it's really hard to reconstruct the history of what happened to Jupiter. But it's not impossible. We have all of those other objects that were affected That's right. by it. And so if you can put together that puzzle, you can really read what happened back there in the past. So that's, that's, that's right. where we're trying to go. We're not there. We need a lot more information, but that's where we're trying to go. Okay, question from uh, Gary uh, Boss, I think it is, or Bossy. I don't know if, it's, if you pronounce the E or not, for Mike Brown, uh, also from YouTube. Would you rather see us explore and live on the moon or try to do the same on, uh, to an asteroid if you had to make a choice? <laughs> explore and live on the moon or an asteroid? Um, I have to say, living on most asteroids sounds like a pretty bleak thing because uh, they're pretty small. Um, although, you know, if you're going to live somewhere, Ceres might be the right place to go. It's got it's got water presumably in its subsurface. You could you know make a big pipe down there and and uh, drink up. Um, oh, which would I rather see? I, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I would rather see one of those than neither of those. Um, I I am. Fairly ambivalent. They're they're not they're not scientific quests. Those are human quests, which I think are important things. Uh, exploring the moon, exploring asteroids, landing on them, living on them. Um, I, I I would love to see it, no matter which one it is and, and where it is that humans are going. Maybe I'll add something. To this. Okay. Um, so I, I don't have a preference really, but I can think of at least two very important experiments that we could do on the moon, which would be much harder to do in an asteroid. So one is to renew these uh, mirrors that astronauts put on the moon to do better lunar ranging experiments, which actually help us a lot with alternative theories of gravity. And the second is we could put on the far side of the moon uh, very low frequency radio antennas with which you could study the very early universe. We could study redshifts of, you know, 20, 30 in very low frequency radio from the far side of the moon, which is very radio quiet. So this would be very interesting experiments you can do on the moon. So you think it's interesting. That's low far in the, on the far side of the moon. That's right. Low That's far, right. low far, instead of being in, in the most populated <laughs> part of the Earth, being on the far side of yes. the moon. And I agree with Mike in that, you know, as much as all of us on this, this webcast love science, it's, it's not science that's going to drive the choice of where humans actually go in space. It's, it's more of the human drive to explore where people want to be. I know that uh, I know an awful lot of people who would love a chance to go walk on the moon, and so I I suspect that you know if, if governments don't do it, then private companies will be doing it at some point in the not so distant future. Just yeah, because I think and there's a lot lines, of desire for it. Of course, yeah. And along these lines, you probably know very well, Emily, and even uh, Mike probably does. There's a company called Planetary Resources recently that has uh, decided that. Uh, it would be nice to just mine an asteroid for all the <laughs> minerals that it contains, right? right? And so and these guys are actually, they seem to be pretty serious. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that, that, that you alluded to in your talk uh, earlier today, Mike, was uh, how JWST is going to bring some of these uh, 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 observations that you've been waiting for, in particular, I think, spectra. Uh, can you explain a little bit for the people, uh, I wanted, I wanted, for the people who couldn't attend your talk, you were making a point that we are taking, we, we can learn a lot about the properties of some of these uh, Kuiper Belt objects uh, using, you know, uh, photometric uh, spectroscopy. And, and by the way, that, for those of you who don't know, that's using filters in cameras to try to figure out the composition of what's of what something is made of. And because, and, and you do that by having a certain small wavelength range. And if and if something is bright in that wavelength range, you can kind of infer that something of uh, uh, material and element is there. But an actual spectrum, which JWST will have uh, with NearSpec is something that Mike was making the point that he could really use uh, to, get, to gather more knowledge about what we don't know about the Kuiper Belt. Would you just comment on that a little bit, Mike? Because I'd like to share what you said a little bit to the people who are watching now. Well, so one of the, the interesting things about, we, we've been trying very hard to learn about what, what's on the surface of these objects in the Kuiper Belt, and we do it by, by doing spectroscopy, which is to say that uh, we, we look at the sunlight after it reflects off the surface of the object, and we then put it through our spectrograph, you know, our big prism, basically, um, and see how much light comes out of each wavelength. Every chemical, every mineral um, in the universe has, has a unique fingerprint um, spectroscopically. So when I look at 
I uh, can tell you like this moment when I first looked at the spectrum of Eris, right, when it came off the telescope. You looked at that and you saw these deep absorptions, this fingerprint that tells you this thing has methane all over the surface of it. It's like instantly you know what's going on. Eris is one of the brightest things that we've discovered out there, so that one was pretty easy. But the interesting objects for really understanding what's going on are not these biggest objects, which have um, actually, it's, it's, it's like what, uh, what Emily said, these are the ones, the, the big objects that are that are round are sort of interesting geophysically because they have evolved since the earliest times. Those are actually less interesting for thinking about what happened um, at, the, at the beginning. You want the small ones that haven't evolved. These are very faint, and we've had a hard time getting any kind of fingerprinting uh, on them um, whatsoever. And most importantly, actually, to me, the thing that for J JWST is most exciting is that, that we're going to be able to extend the, the wavelength range further and further into the red, to the infrared, where we can't see, um, than we can do from the ground. From the ground, we can do the visible that we can see with our eyes, and we can go a little bit further out um, from beyond what we can see with our eyes. But JWST is going to extend much beyond that. And the chemicals that we're particularly interested in, they have these vague fingerprints um, in the regions that we can see from the ground. And when you get to the regions where you can't see, they have these huge, whomping fingerprints. And so uh, we have been trying to pull as much information as we could with these really not quite suited techniques. And then uh, JWST is just going to be able to um, just, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing in the, in the, how quickly and how powerfully it's going to be able to, to survey these regions of the outer solar system. Yeah, but it's not a uh, it's not a ground based telescope, is it? Huh? <laughs> you were talking about how much you liked uh, using ground based telescopes, so you can get the data right away. Well, it's <laughs> close enough to right away for me. It's not a, you don't have to. Uh, I mean, it's not been because it's been you know I don't know how many years that we've been been talking about this, but it's still yeah. from the from the conception of the project. Yeah, it's still I, a while. This is what I love about astronomy. You conceive a project. You go off, you get the data, the data comes in, you have it, you go um, figure out what's going on. It's just a, it's a delightful field in, in which to work. It's really, I mean, it, it rewards being able to come up with ideas quickly, go off and do them and figure it out and, and then go off to the other one in ways that it's really hard in a lot of other fields. It's, uh, it's, it's why I like it so much. Okay, so I'm looking at the event page on Google+, and Matt Nielsen is asking about Sophia. So this would be, I guess, to anybody who knows, I don't know a lot about Sophia, uh, although their their booth is right here, maybe you could pull one of those guys over here. But it says, I read once about the Sophia spacecraft and the 2011 Pluto occultation. Uh, what have we learned about Pluto from that experiment, and has there been any other Kuiper Belt research done with Sophia? This telescope sounds amazing to me. Yeah, so Sophia is pretty cool. So Sophia is a a uh, uh, it's about a three meter I think telescope that that sits on a uh, on a 747 that they cut a big hole out of the side of and uh, they can they can look at the out the side with the telescope way up 40,000 feet in the air. It's a great telescope for doing occultations. Occultations are when um, an object that, that's moving in the sky happens to move right in front of a star and those are uh, important probes of um, you, you watch the star disappear and reappear and you can tell how big the object was if the object has a little bit of an atmosphere, the star doesn't quite disappear because at first you essentially have a sunset, a star set. The star sort of disappears a little bit, then disappears and comes back. So you can learn a lot about um, these, these atmospheres and these objects. And Pluto has been one of the prime objects of study because it has such a vigorous atmosphere. Um, so one of the very first occultations, the, the very first occultation um, that Sophia did uh, was with Pluto. And the reason that Sophia is so great is because those occultations um, can only be observed from specific areas of the Earth each time, and you're never quite sure exactly where it can be observed from. And you might, you might or might not have a telescope there at the time. If you don't have a telescope there at the time, it's pretty convenient to have your telescope mounted on an airplane that can take off and go fly there and then go observe it. So at the Pluto occultation, not only could, did they fly to the right place, but they updated like an hour ahead of time, and they, they called up the pilot, and they're like, head north fast, and they turned and, and uh, went like crazy to get to the the right location. I saw a presentation on this and they said that their most that their biggest technical difficulty was not getting that update and flying to the right point. It was getting the okay from flight con uh, whatever whoever controls the flight lanes to be able to move the plane into different paths. They're not used to 747s doing that. So <laughs> that was their challenge. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so no, this this is not about Sophia. Uh, I just want to add something because uh, Mike said quite a bit about JW Gable 
to do for Kuiper object. I, I want to put a sentence about what JW Steel would do for extrasolar planets. Okay. Uh, so, you know, until now we've looked at extrasolar planets and, and we looked at them as they go in front of their parent star. That's the transit we, method. We found a point here and a point there which shows that, that there, are, there may be water there, there may be sodium, there may be this, there may be that. JWST will give us a real spectrum of that atmosphere, of, uh, you know, with, with an enormous signal to noise and very high resolution. So we will be able to tell, uh, you know, precisely what is the temperature run in that atmosphere. Uh, is there a temperature inversion at some point? Is that atmosphere carbon rich or oxygen rich? and things like this. How rich is it in water? You know, if the water goes up 100 kilometer, you will be able to tell that there is liquid water probably on the surface and, and, and things like that. So, so JWST is going to be just incredible for extrasolar planets. Very true. Very true. Very so uh, I, I, I want to... Uh, there's a quick Gary Boss again from... Uh, YouTube, uh, is there any evidence for an atmosphere on Eris? Uh, no. Uh, there, so there has been um, a stellar oh. occultation, just like we were talking about um, before. Stellar occultation was two years From ago. Sophia. Now. Um, the, well, there was, it wasn't observed with Sophia. Uh, Sophia has only done that one occultation with Pluto. Sophia is still oh. in its. Uh, it still has the training wheels on, um, basically. Uh, so I think there will be more occultations coming soon, but there was one. Very, there has been one occultation seen with Eris, um, and it happened to go across uh, it, the the shadow. If you can imagine, what happens is that that as seen from the star, um, Eris moves across the Earth, and so you're seeing the shadow of Eris going across the Earth from seeing that star. So that shadow went across South America, and it happened to go across a couple of small telescopes. They didn't have great data. Um, but no atmosphere was detected. Eris, to be fair, is pretty far away. It's, it's the uh, most distant object humans have ever seen in orbit around the sun, so it's pretty far away. Um, and so the atmosphere right. that it certainly has at times, uh, most of it is presumably frozen solid to the surface. So if it has anything, it's going to have just a few wisps of an atmosphere going on out there. Okay, so, well, uh, okay, I, I want to, I think we'll have to kind of cut it there. Our network is getting really dicey at this point, and we've, I've actually gone over my time that I was, uh, that I, that I uh, was going to do this for, but I, I just, I, I just lost all track of time. Um, I want to thank Emily and Mike Brown, uh, Emily Lockwaller from the Planetary Society and Dr. Mike Brown from Caltech for joining us. Thank you both so much for help, for, for joining us today. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it too. Are you there? Yeah, it was great. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Dr. Mario Livio, thank you for joining us. Too. This has been a lot of fun. Alberto, we did it again, man. Another yeah, good one. Another, one. another good one. Go. Thanks to everybody who, who replied thank on you. YouTube and, and all the comments you guys had. I tried to get to as many as I could, but you guys were streaming pretty good, pretty quick on that. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the topics and comments uh, I'll try to answer after the fact on YouTube. And we should do these again. Yeah, we're going to keep at it. Thank you guys for watching. And as always, keep looking up.